Oh, no, pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me on here. Of course. I'm hoping the um, I'm hoping that Robert got the uh, the invite as well. I don't see him here yet. Right, anyone get started? Yeah, hey Robert, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's four o'clock. Welcome to Tumor Talk. Uh, we're back again on a new day. It's Monday now. We, we've done this on Tuesday since you know before COVID. Um, and to accommodate some scheduling shifts, we've moved to Mondays. And I can't think of a better uh, talk to give on a Monday than a, than discussion on meningiomas, just for alliteration purposes, anyway. So. <laughs> Meningioma Mondays. Um, we probably won't continue that much longer, but at least for today, we're good. Uh, this is a joint collaboration with the Journal of Neuro-Oncology and Lenox Hill Hospital. We've been running it now for a few weeks. We like to highlight the uh, reasons, the rationale, the relevance of, of recent publications in the journal. This talk, uh, and today our special guests, uh, Jai Thacker and Robert Riesenberg, uh, are award-winning abstracts on meningioma research. And this has been part of an ongoing series where we've been highlighting these abstracts and this research um, that have been submitted to the tumor section. So without further ado, I really do welcome you guys today. Uh, it's, it's our privilege. Dr. Sheehan usually joins a couple of minutes later, so he'll be here. Um, why don't we get started with Jai Thacker since you're already up there. Introduce yourself, give us a little rundown of what you're doing. And um, we'll go, we'll try to take a few questions after and then we'll move over, okay? All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, the entire team of Lenox Hill and Journal of Neuro-Oncology for having us here. It's, it's a, truly a pleasure. So I'm Jay Tacker. Um, I am currently faculty at University of South Alabama, Mobile, uh, up deep south here. And uh, the, but this this kind of um, research is more focused on what I did or learned in my fellowship with Dr. Kelly and Barkadarian up at uh, Santa Monica. So um, you know, I um, basically looking at the minimally invasive. Uh, treatment options for, for especially an elderly population uh, for meningiomas. And I'm going to talk about outcome three admissions and, and tumor control uh, from there. And the author, uh, you know, you see a bunch of authors and all of them uh, did a great job in helping me get this project ready to go. And uh, we have a bunch of students, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, neuro-ophthalmologists, uh, co-neurosurgeons, um, our, our ENT experts, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, so, you know, moving on, I have no disclosures uh, for this talk. Um, goals of the study, it's, you know, as much as we're going to talk about the surgical outcomes, the complications, the readmissions, uh, the good and bad of, uh, you know, the skull-based meningiomas and regular meningiomas as well, uh, it's important to uh, kind of highlight what, what patients we did not operate on, um, what were the indications for surgery, especially in the elderly population, um, and then, you know, talk me, uh, about keyhole or minimally invasive approaches. Um, is, it, is it just cosmetic? Is it just smaller incisions? Uh, what exactly is, you know, minimally invasive approaches? Um, so moving on to the methods, we basically looked over uh, 10 to 12 years of uh, our database uh, at Pacific Neuroscience Institute uh, and uh, at John Wayne Cancer Center and uh, did a retrospective analysis. All of the data was fed in a prospective database and so it's essentially a retrospective analysis of a prospective database. Total about 291 patients uh, met this criteria, uh, median age of 60 years and total of 323 operations, but we're gonna focus on 118 elderly population uh, patients uh, over 65 years of age, uh, which underwent 126 operations. About 20% of them were redo operations. Um, and then 63% of our cohort was skull base and remaining were non skull base. Um, just to give a hint of um, you know, the, the areas which we call minimally invasive are 
especially the operations we did when you could do it to a traditional route uh, and we opted for a lesser, lesser um, you know, more precise focused craniotomy route, uh, which includes an eyebrow approach or supraorbital on the left off, uh, mini terional remaining around close to superior temporal line, of course, endonasal for some meningiomas. Um, then a lot of times, uh, you know, for big parafalcy meningiomas, especially near the more strip or eloquent cardiacs, you don't want to manipulate too much. So we came from the contralateral side and did it endoscopically uh, or endoscope assisted um, as well for, for contralateral transphalcine approaches. And then the traditional workhorse of retrosec approaches with smaller incisions and, and using endoscopes uh, for, for covering some blind spots, which we'll talk about later. Um, so coming on, sorry, I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna use some busy slides, but I'll walk you through them. Uh, this, is, these are, this is a table. The first half of the table is essentially uh, covering the patients with uh, did not undergo surgery. So essentially, if you look at it, um, very few patients did have peritumor edema, but because of their age, uh, you know, some 90, 93, in 80s, we opted for conservative management. And most of them remained stable, except in this group, one patient had intermural growth. Um, and the patient chose to keep following it. You know, he was 81 year German and essentially asymptomatic. Uh, some skull-based tumors as well, intermittent diplopian few, but you know, out of all the 31 patients which we observed, uh, one end up you know, having a substantial growth requiring a stereotactic rate of surgery. Uh, and then subsequently has been tumor, uh, you know, uh, uh, the tumor growth has stopped uh, since uh, then. Uh, and it's been about 18 months or so. Um, and as far as, you know, patients we did operate on, uh, you know, what were the indications? Uh, mainly, you know, obviously the easy ones are symptomatic, having some sort of weakness, some deficit, some drift, uh, some seizure, but apart from that, maybe associated peritumor edema, um, you know, tumor has grown in size and you've watched it, you know, in subsequent scans, uh, are a combination of all these. There were four patients in which it was purely incidental and the patients just wanted it out and it's patient's preference at that time. Uh, and we and we removed this, uh, the tumor. Uh, the mean age of the patients which were observed were a little higher than the operated ones. There was 78 as opposed to 72. And as expected, the me maximal tumor diameter was uh, obviously higher in operated 135 millimeters as opposed to 22, uh, which was not significant. Uh, so just a rundown of like basic analysis of the two groups, non-elderly on the left, elderly on the right side, uh, not majorly anything was different except as expected, the, cap the preoperative KPS score, you know, was better in, in non-elderly group. Uh, but apart from that, everything was pretty similar. The approaches used uh, for Keel uh, specifically were endoscopic endonasal supraorbital, mini retro retromastoid along with suboccipital, and then uh, transphalcine approaches as well. Uh, the endoscope used during the surgery, roughly about 50%, uh, you know, 40, 40 to 50 percent of the times we bring in an endoscope uh, to see the anatomy better and maybe take more tumor out. Um, and the gross total and near total resection in elderly was about 71 percent, and uh, and in non elderly was 67 percent. Um, again, want to direct you to this this uh, row that says you know there were a lot of tumors with uh, invasion to Meckel scape, camera sign, and certain protemporal fossa, and, uh, and you know uh, it's not possible to take the entire tumor out. Uh, at least uh, you know, in our experience. Um, and then following up uh, in medial, medial length of stay um, is three days um, for, for these challenging tumors um, in both cohorts, so no significant difference if you're elderly or not. Um, improved functional outcomes, let me try to move this, improved functional outcomes um, in about over 85% uh, overall had improved uh, or stable KPS uh, score before they came in. A major complication was seen in about 8% of the cases overall, and readmission rates varied between 4 to 5%, uh, no significant difference in elderly as opposed to non-elderly group. Uh, this is mainly for the elderly group for the complication rate. Um, about five patients had, had a, um, a stroke after surgery. Uh, three of them recovered to baseline KPS, and then two had deficits, permanent deficits after surgery. Uh, hematoma, um, two of them required reoperation worsening vision or cranial nerve deficits was seen in roughly about uh, three to four percent of our cases. Uh, zero wound infections, no meningitis, and uh, no pseudomeningocele or CSF leaks was noted. Importantly, I think uh, when we talk about elderly, it's important to mention uh, systemic complications. Uh, except one aspiration pneumonia, we did not notice any DVT, PEs, or any cardiac events uh, in our patient population. Uh, 
Um, this is this is just the elderly cohort. This, this is table. just the elderly cohort, correct. Right. Um, and then the readmissions, uh, fairly low, I would say, 4%. Uh, two of them were sub zeros, uh, which were managed conservatively. One, we felt like the decadron was being a little faster, and we put it back on patient improved uh, some seromal collection, which was non operative. And then uh, transient neural decline, which improved after storage as well. Uh, stratifying these patients based on you know five five year uh, age group, uh, we so as expected the ASS score and the core morbidities more than three or three or more uh, increase as the age progressed. This is obviously expected, but despite this progression, if you look at the uh, the complication rate, the mean um, length of stay, uh, e the median was three all across, did not change much. Um, certainly the, the uh, the gross order resection rate uh, or near total, which was less, more than 90% but less than 100%, was, um, I would say, a little less uh, in, in more than 80 year uh, age group as well. Um, as far as the tumor control is concerned, we had data for over just over 100 patients and uh, noticed about 4% of the patients had recurrence uh, despite gross order resection. And then uh, of the patients who had residual, about 10% of them had um, the tumor progression. Uh, so overall, 15 patients with some sort of recurrence or progression, which required three of them required repeat surgery, and remaining uh, were managed by uh, mainly stereotactory surgery with good control um, from there. Um, so you know we did uh, publish this paper as well in the GNS Focus uh, recent uh, edition. But offshoot of our our discussion, I think it's also you know important to uh, we kind of like mentioned briefly about. Um, above or below, and if you're talking about minimally invasive, are we going to use an endoscope or, an, or a supraortical craniotomy for, for a standard tuberculum cell? And this particular illustration, this is uh, drawn by our illustrator, Joshua Emerson. Um, we essentially, this could go either way, to be honest. And then looking at more precise details about the cella, um, you know, the shallow nature of the depth of the cella, the tuberculum angle, more tumor above the planum, and, uh, and certainly plus minus, um, I would say optic canal invasion are, are kind of important factors. So if you go back, you know, say this tumor does not have optic canal invasion, has a little bit of lateral extent uh, along with a shallow cella. So pretty much very favorable for, for an eyebrow craniotomy um, as opposed to say this tumor, which has an expanded tuberculum. So, you know, pretty steep tuberculum angle uh, along with uh, you know, say optic canal invasion, you know, in our series or protocol, we, we would probably favor um, going from below uh, or using an endoscope. Uh, if you look at this, these are actually very favorable from either one. Um, we decided to go from below just because, um, because of this coronal cut, essentially bilateral optic uh, canal invasions um, in, our, in our hands uh, was more amenable for endoscopic resection in which you can uh, nicely decompress the optic canal pretty extensively. Uh, and you can see the nice neoceptral flap enhancing there. And, you know, for interior skull based tumors, uh, favor more obviously um, uh, eyebrow approaches just because it's, you have a better olfaction preservation as coming from below. You know, you disrupt the cribriform and uh, certainly better uh, cosmetic outcomes. Bushy eyebrows is always helpful uh, in, in having a better uh, cosmetic appearance after an eyebrow. Uh, more importantly, I think it's important to recognize that you're making, when you make an eyebrow approach or mini terminals, you're obviously, uh, the exposure is very precise and focused. So you're limited by some working angles and that's why you have these blind spots. Uh, and then there's a learning curve for that. And, you know, with experience, you learn that, you know, the blind spots, where they are and how can they be eliminated? So I think in our series, we, we use endoscope a lot. Um, and, you know, something which I took from the fellowship as well, I, you know, to use endoscopes a lot. So this is kind of an olfactory groove meningioma. You could see the, on the left is the microscopic view. This is the right side. You could see the fox. Uh, you could see the uh, olfactory nerve, uh, the right uh, uh, frontal lobe. Now you br bring in the endoscope, you see this tumor very nicely being peeled off from the olfactory. You see some tumor, which, which we buzz later on to get better, you know, uh, uh, the tumor control. Uh, bipolar the dura, bipolar this attachment, and then you also see the left side very nicely. There's a little bit of tumor and uh, bleeding left there, which we took out. And so this view is obviously very tough to, uh, you know, to have a visualization with with an eyebrow approach. Certainly, if you do a bicoronal approach, you can, you, you know, you can have a better approach with microscope. But, um, but you know, eyebrows, um, good exposure, heel valve, um, lesser chances of infection, and same exposure. 
Uh, that's kind of like the concept of minim, you know, minimally invasive. Uh, traditionally, you know, this is also another clinoidal meningiomas. Um, you, this is a, on the left, you see the uh, eyebrow approach. Uh, on the asterisk, is, you see a little rind of tumor, maybe below the optic nerve. And, you know, most of the people agree, like, you know, the reason they used to do clinoidectomies a lot was because of this blind spot and to mobilize, um, you know, the optic nerve valve and obviously, you know, free up this association with the uh, internal carotid artery. And if you bring in the endoscope, you're pretty much seeing exactly what you would see, uh, you know, with the clinoidectomy being done. Uh, you can, um, you know, you have a good view of the superior hypophyseals, back from cella, you know, tumor left underneath the optic nerve, what needs to be mobilized more. And, you know, you can use like your ring curettes and essentially minimally invasive instruments to take those tumor out. Uh, similarly, in retrosigmoid approaches, this is on the left is a microscopic view. Uh, cranial nerve nine or lower cranial nerves and then seven, eight complex, and there's some tumor in between. But you see how the perspective changes when you introduce the endoscope, you know exactly uh, where you could take the tumor out more safely and define their anatomy very nicely. And uh, this is another view of a, you know, a big parafalcine meningioma, which we did a contralateral approach. Uh, so essentially a fox, and this is the other side, taking the tumor out from the other side. But as soon as you introduce the endoscopes, you certainly start seeing the tumor interface on the opposite side. You know exactly, you know, what needs to be taken out. Um, you know, it's very helpful to get that perspective with the endoscope when you're using this contralateral keyhole approaches or, or you know, other approaches as well. Um, what one big thing is, you know, if um, in, in big tuberculum cell meningiomas, uh, the, this is actually the image I showed before, uh, was very calcified. When you're taking it out from like a conventional terional or an eyebrow approach, you know, a lot of times the stock is kind of the blind spot and you don't know where the uh, stock is. It takes some time and coming from below eliminates that. Um, and, you know, you see a nice view of the stock here after the tumor has been decompressed, uh, posterior communicating artery, you can see superior hypophyseals. Uh, you, you can trace the pituitary gland all the way back and keep gently lifting up the tumor. So the, the stock is very predictable. You can avoid a major catastrophe coming from below if, you know, as the, uh, obviously the evolution happens in, in surgical techniques. So, you know, overall, I think patient selection we talked about is, is very important. Obviously, these are benign tumors, uh, especially in elderly, uh, don't merit a complication. So obviously, you know, if stuck to an artery and if you can get it all, it's, it's better. We have good backup plan in terms of stereotactic radio surgeries um, of different sorts. Um, certainly, then minimally invasive concept is more on brain uh, and not just only skin. Skin, for sure, heals better. Smaller incisions heal better. Uh, but not using retractors, using more endoscopes and making smaller uh, or precise openings uh, for the pathology needed, uh, kind of like are important. Uh, using endoscopes frequently, I think that is, um, you know, one of the biggest take home messages for me at least. Um, and, you know, more, it defines their anatomy well. You get a panoramic view of what you, you know, didn't imagine before with the microscopic view. And certainly application, I think it's important to recognize that it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you need to do a lot of perionals and um, regular approaches, traditional routes to understand the anatomy better and then, you know, precisely can use that in your, in your training. So, you know, I feel like I used uh, slowly and slowly, I'm, I'm using all these minimally invasive techniques in my practice. This is, um, you know, Barhol MVD I did uh, for trigeminal neuralgia, a patient discharge and postoperative two. Uh, you could use an eyebrow approach. This is one of the patients that had prior surgery before I came here and uh, needed decompression of the brain stem cyst and some tumor debulking, um, which was, uh, you know, uh, easily achievable with, with an eyebrow as far as the exposure is concerned. Uh, certainly some, some vascular, um, you know, you, as much as you want to do, you know, minimally invasive, but this was a ruptured P2 aneurysm with a uh, low dome to neck ratio and could not be coiled or stented. And uh, we, we did a, um, a subtemporal traditional old fashioned subtemporal approach uh, with a fenestrated clip uh, going across the uh, P2 aneurysm. Similarly, an MC aneurysm, very tempted, you know, I kind of like almost lost out to do a terminal for one year in my fellowship. Uh, and then I had to go back to regular terminal on this one since I was not sure what was the working angle of the clips uh, for, you know, to clip this MC aneurysm and then eventually needed three big clips staggering onto each other, which I think, you know, um, in my given limited experience could not have happened with many terminal and as probably, you know, you have a learning curve. So it's important to recognize that and, uh, you know, do the best you can. And similarly, uh, another CP angle tumor we did last week, um, you know, with good outcomes, patient discharge and postoperative did too. Uh, so that those, 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 that was our research, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Jack. 
Yeah, um, to be honest with you, I want to make sure that uh, Robert gets enough uh, time as well. We try to limit these to about 30 minutes so that uh, people stay interested, to be honest with you. So we'll move right into Robert. And then if we have time at the end, we'll bounce back and we'll uh, we'll ask some questions for everyone. Robert, how are you doing? Doing well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I got to remember to unmute here. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Why don't you share your screen and get set up? You can introduce yourself before you start as well. Yeah, so um, I'm Robert Riesenberg. I go by Bob, but uh, I'm a, I'm a fourth year med student at Northwestern, uh, and my talk is primarily the um, clinical work of my research mentor, Dr. Block. Um, and so, can you guys see everything? Okay. Yep. Entire screen. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so this is really a talk about an approach that is a modification on the superorbital keyhole approach. It's cranial orbital craniotomy, the eyebrow incision for resection of anterior clinoid and tubercular and cell meningiomas. Um, so here we see images of four patients with anterior clinoid or tubercular and cell meningiomas. Uh, these, these lesions commonly grow and compress the optic appar apparatus. Uh, resulting in visual deterioration, which is the most common presenting symptom. So the goal of surgery for these patients in general is decompression of the optic apparatus in order to preserve or restore as much visual function as possible. Uh, historically, these have been um, approached with either a teronal or orbizygomatic approach. Uh, transphenoidal as well can be used as we just talked about. Um, more recently, the minimally invasive trans eyebrow superorbital keyhole approach, which involves a small craniotomy just above the orbital rim. Um, so as we just talked about, the, this uh, really is trying to reduce morbidity related brain retraction. Um, but uh, you are limited in your viewing angles and in your intraoperative maneuverability. So I'm gonna describe a modification that kind of tries to address some of those issues. So here we can see how the patient's positioned and the eyebrow incision is planned just like a normal superbal craniotomy, head rotated 15 degrees to the contralateral side. Um, soft tissues dissected and the uh, temporalis muscles and size are reflected away from the superior temporal line. Um, next step is the osteotomes taken used to uh, break the lateral orbital wall and the uh, orbital roof through the uh, McCarty burr hole that's been drilled here, um, thereby gaining access to both the intradural, or I'm sorry, the anterior cranial fossa and the orbital space simultaneously. So then the craniotomy is completed by taking a cut through the uh, lateral orbital rim uh, and then the orbital rim more medially, just lateral to the uh, super oral notch and connecting the burr hole to the, the more medial cut with a, uh, with a craniotome. Um, so here we can see that the bone piece can be removed as a single bone flap, allowing you to see the paraorta and the dura here. The paraorta and the dura then uh, dissected away from the remaining orbital roof back to the level of the anterior clinoid process and you can uh, then remove the remainder of the orbital roof in a piecemeal fashion so that you have good visualization of the optic nerve as it enters and exits the optic canal. Um, so the idea behind this is that it allows for good visualization of the optic nerve as you drill out the optic canal to decompress the optic nerve, which is uh, one of the key steps in relieving tension on the optic nerve, relieving pressure on the optic nerve and preserving and restoring visual function in the post-operative period. So following that, the, uh, uh, the drilling is continued down. We don't really have pictures of this, but the drilling can be continued down laterally to the optic strut, releasing the anterior clinoid process. Uh, so we do, we do, Dr. Block does do a extra dural clinoidectomy. The dura is open. And here you can see the, the optic nerve entering and exiting where it enters and exits the dura. Um, the meningioma is then debulked. And here we can see the final result where it's completely debulked and kind of free from the bony detachments. 
Um, so now I'm going to talk about a case series of six patients operated on via this approach compared to a traditional frontal orbital craniotomy. They all received preoperative acuity and visual field testing. Uh, this table summarizes the results of the case series. On the top, we have the cranial orbital patients uh, with the approach just described. The bottom, the traditional frontal orbital patients. In terms of presenting symptoms, visual deterioration was most common, uh, followed by headaches. Two patients presented incidentally. Uh, in terms of diameter and other tumor characteristics, the groups were similar. Um, there was a high rate of optic canal invasion and cavernous sinus involvement in two groups. Uh, with only these two patients in the cranial orbital group not having either of these features. Um, so uh, the dural attachments of the tumors were not uh, uh, coagulated in this area. So this kind of limited the ability to achieve a Simpson one or two resection. So only one patient in the cranial orbital group achieved a gross total resection defined as a Simpson grade one or two. Um, but only one patient also uh, had tumor recurrence in the follow-up period, and that patient was in the frontal orbital group. That was asymptomatic, didn't require any intervention. Um, in terms of visual outcomes, uh, for patients with preoperative visual deterioration, two out of four patients in the cranial orbital group improved in the postoperative period compared to three out of three patients in the frontal orbital group. This difference wasn't statistically significant, these two patients up here, uh, whose uh, postoperative vision was uh, stable and impaired, patient one had a long standing tumor, which had been previously resected and irradiated, and she presented with over a year of visual deterioration. Uh, patient two uh, had uh, hypertension and diabetes, which had contributed to an ischemic optic neuropathy. So, uh, given their, uh, their, their situation, a stable visual outcome was considered pretty good for these patients. Nobody had a postoperative visual worsening. In terms of complications, uh, the cranial orbital group, one patient had a new superior scotoma in the, in the contralateral side, but uh, on the left side, uh, she had presented with near complete loss of vision, which was almost completely preserved postoperatively. So she still had a uh, good visual outcome. And uh, in terms of the frontal orbital group, three out of the four patients had uh, uh, complications related to soft tissue dissection. So numbness, pain, and a frontalis palsy. And this difference between the two groups with regards to the soft tissue dissection complications was statistically significant. Um, so in order to also assess how minimally invasive approaches uh, compared to transcranial and transphenoidal approaches reported in the literature over the past 10 years. We did a literature review using these search terms and we compared visual outcomes and complications in these groups of patients. We found that amongst patients uh, with preoperative visual deficits, patients in, in operated via a transphenoidal approach actually were about one and a half times more likely to experience post-operative visual improvement compared to transcranial and the superorbital keyhole patients. Um, this may be related to uh, selection for these patients. So I couldn't do statistical st uh, tests on these because we only had averages reported in a lot of the papers, but the tumor size was smaller in the transphenoidal group on average. And tumor size has been uh, reported as an important prognostic factor for determining a visual outcome following surgery. So a selection probably played a role in the difference in uh, outcomes. Um, and then in terms of complications, CSF leak and meningitis were significantly more complicated, or I'm sorry, significantly more likely in the transphenoidal patients relative to the uh, transcranial and superoral keyhole patients. And stroke and new neurologic deficits or vascular injury and hematoma were significantly less likely in the transcranial patients compared to the transcranial and uh, keyhole patients. Um, so in summary, uh, we described a minimally invasive trans-eyebrow cranial orbital craniotomy, which uh, 
attempts to uh, address some of the shortcomings of the, or difficulties of the superorbital keyhole uh, approach with the addition of orbital rim and roof removal. And uh, we demonstrate the safety and efficacy of this approach through comparison of this approach to a traditional frontal orbital approach where we found similar visual outcomes and decreased complications related to soft tissue dissection in our case series. And also in our literature review, we found that transferoral approaches are applied in a more limited population of patients maybe, um, but have improved visual outcomes for these patients, probably potentially partially related to uh, the initial tumor characteristics, uh, but also higher rates of CSF leaky meningitis. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Block, and uh, Dennis, John, and Aiden who helped me with this project. Great job, man. Thanks a lot, Bob. So, you know, we're, we're limited in time here. Like I said, I like to cut it short. I guess, you know, the one thing that I, I gather from both of you, it's actually great that you guys both presented because I think it's, uh, you know, very, very interrelated here. Um, but regarding, you know, these procedures, I feel that what you're showing is that the smaller, more minimally invasive approach, regardless of age, really, is not just a better recovery time for patients, but you're you're getting not just equivocal, you know, um, outcomes, but it may be sometimes even better. Is that what you're finding in your standard practice? I mean, is, is there any time now? I mean, Ja, you know, you pointed this out. There are still times to do the bigger craniotomies, but um, is that the way? Is that the sentiment that I think I'm getting out of this? Um. I yes, the answer to that is yes for sure. I, I think there's certainly a learning curve, and you know, um, it's 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 more to do with like once you're past that learning curve in terms of under first. I think the first hurdle is to understand the concept uh, that you know it's just not smaller incisions. It's it's more to do with like how uh, how how are you basically handling the brain? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know how many times I got uh, you know I recognized during my fellowship that be gentle, be gentle. You know. Uh, releasing CSF, uh, you know, cistern, cistern relaxation, uh, no, you know, no need of um, brain retractors, uh, and then the heel valve because it's a smaller opening. Uh, you know, I, I feel like um, that's the first part to understand, like, you know, first is brain handling, um, then, you know, knowing the anatomy, if you've done enough of like, um, you know, the regular, you know, as you go through residency and you do enough of like, you know, regular terrional or middle fossas or petrosals, then you kind of know what, um, you know, kind of um, needs a bigger operation and what does not. And then I think uh, the major shift I think which has happened is, is the, the goal of the surgery, I think. Um, uh, you know, I mean, this may be controversial, but a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of times now we leave the tumor behind and it's okay. I think it's, uh, that's just my training and I may be wrong completely. And you know, some people may not agree with that, but um, I, I feel like learned that it's it's completely okay to leave benign tumors behind, um, you know, and, and give the patient the best quality of life. And if they occur, uh, the data suggests great outcomes for you know radiation. Um, and so that's yeah. I think the goal of surgery also matters. In, in addition, uh, one last point is I think I didn't mention my talk is is Tiva protocol, which we uh, which I learned that we use a lot in my fellowship and I've started using in my practice here um, is total IV anesthesia. And I think the post-operative post -operative cognition uh, is much better. Delirium is much less, less nausea, vomiting, lesser chance of complication, and patients are up and about very fast. So you're doing, you're doing TIVA on all these cases? All of these cases. Correct. Are you doing it on big terrionals as well, or just on the minimally invasive boutique stuff? So, you know, big terrionals, say, for example, uh, the MCA aneurysm, which we uh, clicked, yeah. I, I had a patient was monitored, so they had to use TIVA regardless. They had to, no matter what, yeah. Right. And so, but, uh, you know, it'll, um, it's a bad day if you don't use TIVA anymore. And I feel like the patients are waking up just much better as opposed yeah. to gas and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I got to tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed with both of you. I want to thank you both for being a part of this. Um, it's, uh, it's been a great session. And so we hope to have you guys back. Obviously, Jai, your paper came out, but uh, Bob, let us know when your paper comes out and keep us in mind for future papers as well. And we'll get you guys back on here. Um, this will be posted, just so you guys know, on the YouTube site uh, for the JNO. It's been streaming live on Instagram and YouTube right now as well. So you can feel free to share this along uh, to colleagues and students interested. And uh, good luck to both of you. We look forward to having you back. Well, thanks so much for this uh, opportunity. Appreciate it. Yes, thanks, guys. Thank you.
Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Sure.